Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, for History 101, we do Athenian philosophy, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. So we start off with, what's the job of philosophy? Well, in the ancient world, it's very different from today. Today, it's mostly ethics. And so uh, many of you at Candom County will take a uh, biomedical ethics and that's not a science course, that's a philosophy course. And it's, how are you supposed to behave in a certain situation? And that's where philosophy has ended up. But for most of human history, philosophy was science. It was trying to explain how the world worked. So it's science without the math, because the Greeks didn't have the math. Roman numerals, Greek numerals, Hebrew numerals were all based on letters. So they didn't have the theoretical algebra that the Arabs will invent. They didn't have zero. And so you couldn't do experimentations in the way of science that science will be able to do today. And so philosophy was science. It was logic and ethics and physics and naturalists. It was explaining how the world worked. So why Athenian philosophy? Well, Athenian philosophy comes as a reaction to the Athenian defeat in the Peloponnesian War. It is a reaction to a trauma. It is trying to explain how did we, the greatest people in the whole wide world, lose? We shouldn't have lost. And we did. So why is that? How could this have happened? How does the world work and how do people work that such a defeat was even possible? And you see this in your own lives. We've seen, I, I am a generation X. I grew up in the wake of the defeat in Vietnam. And you could see it in the movies. You could see it in the TV shows. You see it in the popular culture that like, look at Rambo, the Rambo movies. Number one, the first one, is a guy who has tremendous PTSD. Just like in Coming Home, just like in The Deer Hunter, just like in Apocalypse Now. These guys have lost the war, and they've come home, and they are um, broken by the war. And American society is broken. Compare that to part two, where his body is completely changed hugely muscular right and there's the famous quote do i get to win this time that's america trying to f figure itself out top gun is a similar kind of movie born in the usa is an anti-war anti-america song it's about ptsd it's about homeless vets. It's about being sent to a war you didn't want to fight and coming home to no help. And how did Reagan and Americans use that song? Still use that song now as a patriotic anthem. I was born in the USA. I know this because as a kid in elementary school, I was in chorus and somebody had the bright idea since it was a popular song on the radio and popular with Reagan. And we were living in a completely white um, suburb of New York. So there's a lot of conservative white people in the 80s in that area. They thought, oh, we'll have the little kids sing it and it'll be great. And so we sang it. And then the music teacher tells you, belt out the Born in the USA song. Sing it as high as you can. Don't even bother with, with tone. Just sing. Just yell. So we do, right? And we finish, and the crowd applauds. Woo! They get up, and they cheer. Woo! USA! USA! But you had eight-year-olds singing about being sent to Vietnam to kill the yellow man. Think about that. You have eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds singing about how the VA 
has told them they have no future. How there's no one to help them. Like, think about the disconnect between what the lyrics are saying and how the crowd is reacting to it and what they're making their children do. And so when do we, we talked about this with the Hebrews, right? With the destruction of Israel by the Assyrians, that the Judeans have to figure out how does the world work? And their answer was, we have a super God. That super God was mad. So it's all of these working out. And a lot of the working out was we didn't really lose the war in Vietnam. That's one of the big things that came out in the 80s. We didn't really lose. We weren't allowed to win. It was the politicians. It was the liberal politicians. It was Johnson. Well, Nixon lost too, and he was very conservative. But that's the idea is it, we were stopped. We could have won. But remember, that generation grew up in the generation of World War II who had won their war. And after the first Gulf War in 1991, George H.W. Bush, the president at the time, said the Vietnam War defeat syndrome is over. We're winners again. Woo! It's 25 years. It's 25 years since the Vietnam had ended. 25 years. It's a generation. Entire generation of kids. Millennials. The, the most millennials were now born. Had never experienced any memory of the Vietnam War. They were, the Vietnam War was done 10 years before they came along. And America was still obsessed with it. That's philosophy. That's what we're dealing with. This trauma. How does the world work? So we start with Socrates, who had the reputation of being the ugliest man in Athens. So, Socrates, ugliest man in Athens. So, Socrates, we're going to talk about these philosophies in um, a bunch of ways. We're going to tell you who the person was, where does knowledge come from, how do you learn, why are there dumb people, what did they think of democracy, and what were they famous for, what is their importance. So for Socrates, we, the ugliest man in Athens, we start with, he's an Athenian citizen. He fought in the Peloponnesian War, which we'll talk about in a later lecture, but it's, it is the Great War of the age, and he survived the defeat at Delium. Delium is a massacre. The army fell apart, the Allies fled, the Athenians got slaughtered by the Thebans. To be at Delium, and this is why I, I'm going to emphasize this, to be at Delium, to survive at Delium, you don't have to prove your patriotism to anybody. And that's going to be a big deal. You put an asterisk there because when we get to the importance and famous for, we're going to talk about this. But it's like Guadalcanal. It's like the bulge. It's, it's, it's Valley Forge. It's... He, 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 if you are there, you don't need to talk about it. If you survived, you don't brag about it. Because it was a terrible, horrible thing. And lots of people didn't survive. So to have been there says something. Because Athens was a democracy. Now notice we're going to talk about democracy later. So what is the number one value of democracy, which Socrates is fighting for, so he must believe in. It's equality. The fight of democracy is equality. That's the fight we're having right now in 2020, 2021, is over equality. That's what the Black Lives Matter protests were. Uh, and I'm recording this a year on the year anniversary of uh, the George Floyd murder. And since the cop was found guilty of murder, we can officially call it a murder. But we are fighting the question of equality. Do we, what is equality? Who is equal? Who gets to count? So whether it's the voting uh, bills that are coming out throughout the South on their... 
regulations, that's the word I'll use, on how one can get a chance to vote. They're tidying up those regulations. Um, that's a question of democracy. That's a question of equality. Who is equal? When we talk about racism, we talk about equality. The fundamental, when we talk about misogyny or patriarchy, we're talking about equality. Who is equal? Who is a citizen? So the fundamental thing, if you were a Democrat, and I mean little d Democrat, if you believe in democracy, the thing you must believe in is equality. You must believe that everyone's vote counts the same as yours. You must believe that everyone else has a say. You, and that that say is important. As important as yours. This is why democracies don't work in history. Because there's plenty of people who go, F that, man. My, I'm better than these people. And we'll talk about that when we hit Plato. But right here in Socrates, and this is why I'm taking some time to talk about this, but right now, you have to understand Socrates. You understand anything that comes next. You must understand he was an Athenian citizen who fought for the democratic government of Athens in an age when no governments were democratic. So he believes in democracy, which means he believes in equality. So where is Knowledge. Where is knowledge located? Where can you find knowledge? In books? In the sky? In the gods? For Socrates, it was innate. It was inside of you. And it was all you needed was inside of you. That doesn't mean it was nuclear physics, but it was means the basic building blocks of knowledge were inside of you. And so he has the great questions. Like, what is love? And we'll talk about that when we talk about Aristophanes. We will, what is truth? And you go, I know what truth is. And this is how Socrates messes with you. Because you go, I know what truth is. And he'll look you straight in the eye. And he, remember, ugliest man in, uh, ugliest man in Athens. So tough, tough to look back. But he's going to look at you and go, what do you do? What do you tell your children every December? From Thanksgiving to January 1st, what do you tell your children? Is that a lie or is that the truth? And you're like, well, it's not the truth. Are liars bad people? Yes, liars are terrible people. Are you a liar? I am not a liar. Do you tell the truth? I kind of lie. And not only do you lie, the entire culture lies. This is some psychologists have written a paper that I read years ago, which was the, uh, the trauma of American youth. And it wasn't poverty, which is terrible. And it wasn't homelessness, which is awful. And it wasn't the lack of health care, which is abysmal. But the trauma for middle class white youth in America is what they get told in December every year by the entire culture. So that by the time you're 10 years old, who has been lying to you? Literally everyone you trust. Everyone. Your parents. Your, ne your uncles, your aunts, the guy who sells you candy at the store, everybody, the mall, everybody. And I know if you're driving and you're listening to this, you're like a little worried, but I'm, I'm, this is as deep as we're getting, but you're a liar. But you don't think of yourself as a liar because liars are bad people and you're not a bad person. You're a good person. But that's what Socrates is there to do, to go, are you so sure you know what truth is? Right? And we do it we do it all the time. A little white lie. The question you get when your eldest is about to get a baby brother or sister? That question? Where? You probably don't tell the truth there, do you? Did you? Or will you? You're probably like, well, you know, did you see Dumbo with the stork? Are you telling the truth? No. Are you okay with that? Yes. But then, 
You tell your kids not to lie. Don't lie. Lying is bad. Bad people are liars. And we make movies about lying liars, liars who lie. And bad things happen to them. And then we go home and go, ah, and then lie all the time. So what is truth? What is courage? What is love? These are the kind of big questions. And what Socrates is saying is, you know what the answer is. It's inside of you. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So how do you learn? You learn by the Socratic method, by someone smarter than you. Remember, you, you, you are dependent. You can't fish yourself. You need someone to help bring the stuff out of you because it's inside of you, but you don't know how to unlock it. A, a, a locked gate, a locked chest cannot unlock themselves. Someone has to put the key in it, and that's Socrates. So you get the Socratic method. Someone smarter than you helps pull it out with leading questions. So let's talk about that. Do you have a soul? Now that is a huge metaphysical question of huge importance, and there have been thousands, tens of thousands of books, the brain power that has gone into whether or not you have a soul is enormous in history. It is the fundamental question of, of Christianity. Now, the answer in Christianity is, of course you have a soul. You have to have a soul. That's how you get the afterlife. That's how you get saved. Okay, prove it. Prove you have a soul. Uh, oh, that's how th tough things happen. So there's a movie that came out uh, back in the 90s, which was like 21 grams. And it's supposed to be like when you die and you weigh somebody the second after they die, they lose 21 grams. And that's like the, the weight of the soul. Well, that's one way of trying to figure it out. But for Socrates and the Socratic method, he don't have a problem. It's not a huge metaphysical question for him. It's a shrug. I'll show you. Socrates, talking to Alcibiades. Now, Alcibiades is one of the craziest dudes in all of Athens. He is a fantastic figure. Um, he's one of the generals that helps save Athens for a little while, and then he's, like, booted out of Athens. Um, he is... He's... Uh, he is, like, Captain Jack Sparrow as a person. He is both aristocratic, cultured, educated, and completely effed up. He will have, it's just, he is one of the most, go and read his Wikipedia page. Go and see um, just the life of Alcibiades in Plutarch. You, that's really what you should read. Plutarch's life of Alcibiades, because that's the crazy stuff. Um, he's a fun character. And this is not literally Alcibiades, but it, there's a point why Plato, when he's writing up this dialogue, is using Alcibiades, but we're not going to get into that, into the more metaphysics of Plato writing about so Socrates talking to Alcibiades. But it's important to know Alcibiades is not a nobody. He is a somebody. So Socrates, the shoemaker, for example, uses a square tool and a circular tool, and other tools for cutting. And Alcibiades says, yeah. Yeah, a shoemaker cuts, you know, leather and whatnot with using different tools. So Socrates goes, yeah, okay. But the tool is not the same as the cutter and user of the tool. Right? And Alcibiades says, of course not. No, the person using the tool is different than the tool. Ah, then, what shall we say of the shoemaker? Does he cut his tool, cut with his tools only? Or does he use his hands? Well, Alcibiades says, well, yeah, he uses his hands. Socrates, are you sure he uses his hands? Alcibiades says, yes. Yeah, his hands use the tool to cut the leather. Okay. Socrates goes, and does not a man use his whole body? Like, if he's using his hand, isn't the hand attached to his forearm? Isn't the forearm attached to the arm? Isn't the arm attached to the body? Like, doesn't he use the rest of his body, too, to make the cuts? To hold the tool? 
And Alcibiades says, certainly. So Socrates says, now notice, Alcibiades has basically not said anything. He's gone, yeah, uh-huh, yep. Uh, Socrates, and that which uses, i.e. the person who uses the tool, is different from that which is used. And Alcibiades says, true. The person who uses a tool is different than the tool. Okay. Socrates, then a man is not the same as his own body? And Alcibiades goes, well, that would make sense. The man is using his body to cut the instrument, but the man cannot be the instrument. His hands are not the instrument. So then the man and the tool are different. Socrates goes, then what is he? If a man is not the same as his body, if the man is not the tool, and at the same time the person using the tool, though we've just said the man uses his hands and his body to help cut, to do the action, then what is he? And Alcibiades says, I, can't, I don't know. I don't effing know. I cannot say. And Socrates, and this is the Socratic method right here. This is the pinnacle of it. Nay, you can say. I know you know it. I know you know it. That he is the user of the body. And the implication is, thus the body and the person must be separate. And Alcibiades says, yes. Socrates says, and the user of the body is the soul? Alcibiades says, yes, the soul. So do you have a soul? Yes, we just proved it. Socrates just proved it in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 lines. In a conversation, 20 lines and 3 minutes long. We just proved it. Now, this is similar to Aristotle. Aristotle does something similar with his prime mover, the unmoved mover. So you talk about the universe, right? Everything in the universe is in an action, right? People are moving, birds are moving, the wind is moving, um, the sun is moving, right? Everything is moving, okay? And it's a basic principle that, and Newton, you know this from Newton, right? That an unmoved object stays at rest. An object at rest stays at rest until something else acts upon it. Right? This is a law of momentum. It's a law of gravity. Right? Aristotle knows this. Like, you put, I put the ball down. I put, I put my iPhone down on the desk. And until something comes along, a hurricane, a fire, uh, a dragon, me, that will stay in that place forever. If you've ever gone to the Eastern State Penitentiary, that's the cool thing about the Eastern State Penitentiary is so much of it is just, it's like people just took off, gone. So much of it looks like it should look. Now, other things look, and you can see where people have come in, people have broken in, things have fallen down, uh, uh, pipes have burst, right? You could see this, like that there's still action going on, but a lot of it has stopped. And Aristotle will say, well, what put all of these things in motion, in motion? And at the start of all things, there must be something that moves, but was not moved. Right? There has to be something that moves, but isn't itself moved. Now, for Abrahamic religions, that's not a problem. That's God. That's Allah. That's Jehovah. That's Yahweh. Right? That's For Christianity, that's God. Right? So Thomas Aquinas will go, that's God. That's not a problem. Newton will use it to say God exists as well. That's the prime mover. And so notice we just invented a soul in 20 lines without breaking a sweat. We didn't have to invent any major concepts. That's the beauty of Socrates. And he says to Alcibiades, you know the answer. You know it. You know that the user of the body is not the same 
as the body itself. You need something that moves the body to do the things the body does. And Alcibiades says, yes, that's true. And so Socrates goes, is that the soul? And Alcibiades says, yeah, it is the soul. <sighs> okay, so then why are there dumb people? And this is where Plato's cave allegory comes in. Now, you have to understand why I keep saying Plato. Plato is the guy who writes down all the stuff about Socrates. Socrates never wrote anything by himself down. So we know Socrates exists because there are other people, Xenophon for, for one, who are students of Socrates. Aristophanes, who hates Socrates, who write about him. So we know Socrates is, we know more about Socrates than we do say about Jesus as a historical figure. But Socrates never wrote anything down. So everything we know about Socrates is written down mostly by Plato. There are other people, Xenophon and other people at the time who wrote stuff down about him. So when I say Plato who writes the allegory of the cave, it's Plato who's writing it, but it's Socrates' idea. And these two get mixed up a lot. A lot. But the allegory of the cave is that no one, why are people dumb? No one was there to show people the truth. And truth is hard. The allegory of the cave is people are chained to a wall and they watch shadows all day. And in watching the shadows, they think the shadows are real because they don't know any better. They are chained to their ignorance. But they're also comforted by it. Now, in the allegory of the cave, Socrates comes in and, and breaks their chains and, and come, brings them, drags them out into the light, into the sunlight to see a tree. And this is education. This is Plato's analogy of education. This is the importance of education. That what you thought when you started, somebody comes and leads you into light to show you much more, to show you the truth, Right? And what do the people do? Do they celebrate? Do they kiss Socrates? No. They go back into the cave. Because they are comforted by their ignorance. And think about it from the people. Now, it's always insulting to the people. I've, I, have, I have heard this at every level, from elementary school to, to college. And no teacher that I've had had ever had sympathy for the people, for the dumb people. They went, see, this is why you need to get an education. So you aren't these people chained to the shadows. And I'm like, dude, do you know how hard it is to be in sunlight? Like, you spent your life in this room looking at shadows, chained to a wall. And now you can leave the room and now you're outside and think about how bright that sun is. Think about now you have clouds, real clouds, and you have wind in your face, and there's smells, and there's so many smells, and your eyes can't adjust. It's too bright. And there's a tree, and there's this crazy-ass guy who just took you out of the cave saying, look at the tree, this is truth. And you're like, I don't even know, I don't know. It's too much. It's too much. For those of you who are D&D &D fans, it's like going to the Feywild. It's just, it's too much. It's like turning, turning your senses up to 12. It's way easier to stay in your little box that you understand, that you know. And this is why people can accept a lot of things about people, but no one likes a smarter person. People can accept they're better at sports, Hell, we pay good money to watch LeBron James be better at sports. I would love to watch Simone Biles do a floor routine just once in my life. I've seen Serena Williams do a backhand. I can't do a backhand like that. Well, that's, that's insulting to Serena Williams. I can't imagine doing a backhand like that. And we accept that. We pay good money for that. Right? Right? We can accept people being better than us at skills, right? The woodcarver. And I look at them and the glass blower and I'm like, that's really cool. The guy who plays the guitar, Eddie Van Halen. I grew up with Eddie Van Halen. I'm like, that's awesome guitars. I can't do that. But I have had students in my class yell at me these words. 
Do you think you're smarter than me? Yes. Yes, student, I do. Within these four walls, in the, in the subject of ancient history, I am smarter than you because you're paying me to be smarter than you. But no one likes that. They didn't want to hear that. Now, I will freely admit there is lots of things I don't know. That's why we have a university with lots of experts in lots of things. And I go over to my science colleagues and I have, I got a question about biology. Let me ask you. And they go, okay, let's talk. And I'm a smart man and they can tell me stuff. And I'll be like, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not with you anymore. And they're like, all right, back it up. Right? I don't know everything. And I never portray to know everything. But in history, I am, I'm paid to be smarter than the students in that history class but i've had once a year maybe once a semester a student usually a boy get up and say do you think you're smarter than me well if i'm not we're in a lot of trouble man because you're paying me to be smarter than you and to tell you this stuff so if i'm not smarter than you we got issues and i'm sure you've been in a classroom where you were like I think I know more than the teacher about this stuff. And that's a problem, right? You never said, ah, this is going to be a great class. I know more than the professor. No, you're like, this is a terrible class. I'm wasting my money. But it's an inherent thing. And this goes all the way back to Socrates. And it goes back to how he dies. And we're going to talk about that. That's why there's an asterisk. No one likes a guy who's smarter than they are. No one likes being told they're dumb. No one likes not even being told they're dumb. Feeling like they're dumber, especially in a democracy where it's all about equality. And we'll come back to this. So what about democracy? Does Socrates believe in democracy? Hell yeah. He fought for it. He believes everyone has equal potential. He is super democratic. Everyone has all the knowledge inside of them. All right. So what about what is he famous for? Well, he's executed. He's executed by the Athenian democracy for corrupting the youth. In fact, there's a play by Aristophanes called The Clouds, which is a hit job. It's an entire play about how dumb Socratic education is. It's a hit, it's a, it's a hit job. And so what we get is John Louis David's 1787 painting, The Death of Socrates, which you can go see. It's in the New York City Met. It is Socrates' last lecture. It's in fact, and this is, uh, there is a... Um, analysis of this on YouTube, which I really like, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I, it makes sense when I look at it, is that Plato, who is seated in the gray, he's seated at the left, is actually traumatized and remembering this event as an old man. I don't remember which person he's supposed to be in it, other than the old man. I don't know if he's the, the young man handing him, the uh, handing Socrates, who's there with one truth, the finger of truth, Right. Um, about to drink the hemlock. I don't know if it's that's him or it's supposed to be Xenophon, but Plato and, or, or if it's Plato at his knee, um, Plato and Xenophon are both supposed to be in this painting. But it's, notice old man Plato is not looking at it. So the idea is that this is an image of the memory exploding out of the back of his head, that he's remembering this trauma and that what's happening is the people who are leaving in the in the back are actually leaving Plato, not Socrates. They're saying goodbye to Plato. Bye, Plato. They've just been over. So um, Plato sees this as truth being murdered by ignorance. Socrates was teaching his students. His students went home. They told their their parents. Their parents, who were conservatives, went, "Oh my God, this is terrible." And they caused the ruckus. We see this all the, all the time, especially in education. We see this all the time of parents being mad about what their kids are learning. I mean, every year there's, at, there's an, uh, 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 an ar um, article, there's an issue of The Atlantic about sex education. Every year, it was Newsweek as well, every year. And it's like, why should there be sex education in America? Or there has to be sex education in America. Look at how we're failing our kids. And what do you get? You get parents who are like, we have to have sex education. And a whole lot of other more conservative parents who are like, keep your liberal 
sex stuff out of my kid's head. And so this has been education from the beginning of time. You know, teachers teach and lots of people reject those teachings and lots of parents don't like those teachings. And so Plato sees it as truth being murdered by ignorance, by the democracy, by the culture. In fact, Socrates in the Apology, which is, you have to understand, Apology in Greek means explanation. It does not mean to say, I'm sorry. That's a Christian take on the word. Christianity, the early Christians after Rome collapses, will take that word, that Greek word, and convert it into an explanation for why I did something bad. Because remember, in Christianity, you are bad. You're a bad person who did bad things. God is good. You are bad. So anytime you're explaining anything to God, it's you're explaining why you did a bad thing. So apology becomes saying you're sorry. But that's not true for the Greeks. So Plato's book, The Apology, is Socrates' defense at his trial. And it's mostly him being like, but I'm not the guy in the movie. I'm not the guy in the movie. I'm not the guy in Aristophanes' play. Because they kept bringing it up. Well, you know, this guy in Aristophanes' play says uh, these really mean things. He's like, that's not me. That's Aristophanes. It's not me. And he's murdered anyway. He's found guilty and he's given the choice of exile or death. He chooses death and he chooses suicide rather than being executed because it's humiliating to be dragged through the streets and have your head cut off and while you're peeing yourself. So this is much more heroic. He's got his six pack abs. He's ripped. You know, he's been benching. You know, he's been lifting, you know. I mean, look at his student. Look at the calves on his student in the red. Like those, that is a dude who knows how to do his squats. And so, boom. Sexy Socrates dies. And that brings us to Plato. Wonder is the feeling of a philosopher. And philosophy begins in wonder. That's a nice quote. That's not going to be much of Plato after this, though, because Plato is traumatized. He is a student of Socrates. He is traumatized by Socrates' death and murder. So he is going to have different ideas. So where does knowledge come from for Plato? The ether is a place you cannot experience where, where there are perfect forms that all things aspire to something. Think of a perfect circle. But only a few special few people are jacked into the ether, can see into the perfect forms. It is a place you cannot go to, you cannot taste, you cannot touch it, you cannot experience it. It is a, no matter what rocket ship Elon Musk will create, you can never go there. And what's there? The perfect form of a thing, the, the ideal. Where everything is great. So think about the perfect circle. Is the circle all things aspire to. You cannot draw a perfect circle. There is no perfect circle. They cannot exist. All that can happen is if you think about a circle and you draw a circle to take out a piece of paper, take out a pencil, take out a pen, and now on that piece of paper, draw a, perfect, draw a circle. How perfect was it? Was it what you thought of in your mind? And then why didn't you draw what was in your mind? And the answer is you could never draw what was in your mind because you are not perfect. You are a human. The paper is not perfect. It was made by humans. The pen or pencil was, is not perfect. It was made by humans. Imperfect things then cannot create a perfect thing. So then the question is, since you have never seen a perfect circle, you've only seen circles closer to what the image in your mind looks like. Where does a perfect circle exist if no one has ever seen one? And don't be like, oh, on YouTube, they could draw perfect circles. No, they can't. Why? Because the definition of a circle is every point is equidistant from every other point. Well, every point is made out of atoms. And we know from basic science that atoms move. They're constantly moving. The neutrons are moving. The electrons are moving. So they're never equidistant. They're always moving. If you were to take a microscope, it's like looking at a razor blade. Oh, the razor blade is sharp. It's very straight. It's a straight razor. They call it straight for a reason. Look at it on the microscope. It's not straight at all. It's all these jagged ridges.
What you think you know, what you think you see, is not what you actually see once you break it down into its component parts, once you get small enough or large enough. So only a few people are jacked into this. So then how do you learn? If I don't have access to the ether, how do I learn? Well, I have someone's education. It's basic American education. It's elementary school. Someone smarter than you tells you what you need to know. Think of tests on your shape or spelling. It's right or wrong. So in the first grade, you go, okay, draw a circle. Well, if you draw a triangle, three lines interconnected, two lines meeting at a point and one line underneath them, your teacher goes, that's wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. That's not a circle. That's a triangle. Dummy, quote unquote. Idiot. You're wrong. Spell smart. S-A-R-T. No. S-M-A-R-T. Big red X on it. You're wrong. You failed. You suck. Someone smarter than you, your teacher, is telling you what you need to know. And so why are there dumb people? Because people are naturally ignorant. They're stupid. For Socrates, they had the potential to learn. In Plato, they're dumb. They're stupid. They don't have potential. They choose to be dumb. They choose to be ignorant. And they're happy with it. And this is Aristophanes' soulmate theory. And you see this all over the place. Now, Aristophanes, there's, there's in the symposium, they talk about what is love. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. What is love? Right? And there's like five dudes all drinking, right? Socrates, Aristophanes, these bunch of dudes. And they go through it. And Aristophanes comes up with the dumbest idea. He's like the soulmate. See, every human was actually one person with like four arms and two sex pieces. And they had one breast and one not breast. And like they were half, they were half of everything smushed together. And then the gods cut them in half. And so you spend your life looking for your, the other half of your body so you can combine it. You know, you put your pieces together. Woo-hoo. So Aristophanes kind of has a, you know, woo-hoo. Knows, knows certain things. Um, and then Aristophanes, you want a tangent? Aristophanes goes into homosexuality and he's like, well, this is what you do. Then he says, you could cure homosexuality by finding the right woman. So guys, is, you know, a homosexual is just a guy who hasn't met, the, met his soulmate woman yet. Because once he meets his soulmate woman, he'll never want to be gay again. It's like, yeah, this, okay. Hey, this is 2,500 years ago. But that's a tangent. I mean, he's all over the place. And what I dislike about all of this is people then go, oh, that's the soulmate. Isn't this wonderful? And Socrates, like, two pages later, is like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Let me tell you what real love is. And then he goes on to explain how it's intellectual. And he's not, like, he doesn't never even references Aristophanes. He's just like, I'll tell you what the right answer is. And yet here we are 2,500 years later, and even the, the, the um, study guides that are out there to help kids cheat all end at 193C. They all end when Aristophanes ends his discussion. They don't go to Socrates, who refutes it two pages later. They all go, isn't that nice? Aristophanes and his soulmate. The whole reason it's there is for everyone to sit there being rolling their eyes, being like, what the dog? I mean, even Aristophanes says, I'm telling you the truth. Don't make fun of me about this because I really, really mean this. It's like, oh, you freaking moron. Who could believe such stuff? And now here we are, and I'm watching 20-something-year-old journalists write about movies, and they're like, this is a wonderful love story. It's like Plato describing love, and it's like, not Plato, it's Aristophanes, and Socrates calls it BS. Like, two pay- please read the rest of the book. Yeah, blows my mind. Because they choose it. She could, the writer, the journalist could have read three more pages, They chose not to. 
They used the thing that they knew. The thing they had been told somewhere in the past. And they just recited it. So to Plato, people are dumb. And they choose it and they're happy with it. That's how Socrates gets murdered. So does he believe in democracy? No way. He thinks it's an idiotocracy. People are too good, dumb to run a government. People are not equal. When he writes The Republic, which is his version of the perfect government, it's run by smart people. There's actually a episode of The Simpsons where Lisa Simpson joins uh, joins the government because she is smart. And so they, they create Springfield into the Republic and Homer destroys everything because the dumb guy destroys it all. And that's an important point. One, people are too dumb and their dumbness destroys things. That's very platonic. The second thing is women are included in that smartness. If women are smart, they like Plato is an early feminist in a weird way. He doesn't like anybody. So if you're smart, whether you're a man or a woman, boom, you're in. You're jacked into the universe. Congratulations. You're one of the few. I've had professors, I've had colleagues back in the day when I was first starting teaching who say the same thing. It's very platonic. They're like, you're only teaching to like two or three kids in the class. Most of the kids are just there occupying space. Like that's not Socrates. Socrates thinks you could reach every, every student in there. Everyone has potential. Plato thinks there's only two or three who really have potential. Everyone else is an idiot. Don't waste your time. And I've heard that from colleagues. And here we are in modern American university, 2,500 years later. So what is Plato famous for? For essentially creating Christian heaven. Like he doesn't create it. It's St. Augustine who does. St. Augustine is a, a Roman bishop. He's a Christian Roman bishop in North Africa in the 400s. So that should tell you something. And that tells you um, the S has hit the fan. Bad things are happening. Rome is collapsing. And so people are coming to him going, Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. He's not a saint yet. Augustine, what do we do? Rome is collapsing. The Vandals have invaded North Africa. What do we do? And he says, don't worry about it. What, what, what do you mean, don't worry about it? Don't worry about it. Your goal is to get to heaven. And they go, uh, Augustine, um, the world is ending. He's like, yes. So you better uh, care about getting to heaven. Don't mess it up. And they're like, okay, 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 okay. Augustine, you're hurting my brain. <sighs> okay. So you're saying, don't worry about the vandals. Don't worry about Rome. Everything's burning down and not to care. He's like, well, you could care if you want, but that's not your real goal. Saving Rome is not as important as getting to heaven. Okay. Well then, help me out here, Augustine. I have read my Bible. I know my gospels. I've read my Ephesians. I have I have I have read my epistles. And none of them talk about what heaven's like. They say it's great. They say Jesus is there. They say I get to hang out with Jesus. But they don't exactly describe it in like detail. It's a lot of amorphous stuff. Am I just going to hang out with Jesus for like ever and like sit there and like stare at him because he might get bored. And Augustine says, well, have you read your Plato? And the people go, Augustine, I am a freaking Roman. Yes, I've read my Plato. Of course, I know he's Greek, but we took their culture over. We have read their books. I went to school. I'm a rich dude. Yes, I have read my Plato. And he goes, well, you know how Plato says there's a place where everything is perfect? And they're like, yes, what does that have to do with anything? And Augustine, now his nose bleeding because he's dealing with these people, is like, that's heaven. Idiot. And they're like, oh, okay, so what's there? Well, you know how there's Rome? Yes, I know how there's Rome. It's awesome. But it's full of poor people and like dirty people and like disease. And like now there's the Goths burning it down. And you're like, well, none of that exists. Rome is perfect in the ether, in heaven. It's the perfect Rome. Heaven is the perfect Rome where everybody's happy. All dogs are puppies. And uh, the streets are paved with chocolate like in The Simpsons. And um, 
and and it's ruled by a perfect emperor, not the stupid ones we've had for the last hundred years. And that perfect emperor is, say it with me, God. St. Augustine lives in the Roman world, so he thought about heaven like a Roman would. Perfect Rome, run by a perfect emperor. And he creates what is essentially the modern Christian heaven. He took Plato, Christianized it, boom, and now we have heaven. Nobody else has this concept until the Muslims come along and take it from the Christians. Nobody else has a concept of a better heaven. Like the Egyptians, it's the same life as you already got. Everyone else, a lot of other people are going into a deep, dark hole. There's no one who's like, oh, it's better, much less perfect. There is no concept of perfect in most of the ancient world. Life sucked. And so here's St. Augustine being like, it's the perfect Rome. Well, now here we are. You don't know what Rome is like. You've never been to Rome and Rome has changed. So it's when you think of heaven, you don't think of Rome. I'm going to bet most of you, especially if you grew up in the suburbs, think of a suburb. You think of parks and maybe a nice river and it's sunshiny. And maybe there's a golf course that you could always get a good tea time with. And there's a nice breeze, right? And you have great houses and every lawn is manicured. Like, what is your concept of heaven? Like, think about it. Write it down. What do you think heaven is like? And is heaven really like a better version of where you grew up? Think about that for a moment. What is heaven like? Is it Disneyland? Is it Disney World? But without the heat and the humidity and without the long lines? So kind of February at Disney World? If you've ever been to Disney World in February, but before the holidays, you could go, yeah, this is perfect. This is great. No lines. Get right on. No heat. No humidity. So Plato becomes the basis of these ideas. Of these, if 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 anything is a trying to be perfect, it's Platonic essentially. It's aspiring, and you've seen this. You've done this. You you do it with when you break up with people. You're like, why are you breaking up with me? And you're like, because this is not the relationship I want. I want a better relationship with a better person. Well, how do you know that better person exists? There's a Buffy episode where they're they're in a in an alternate timeline, and and um, and um, the librarian is like about to smash the crystal that that is causing the alternate timeline, and the demon's like, "How do you know the other timeline is any better than this?" And and um, Giles goes. Because it has to be. Like, that's Plato. That's Platonic. It has to be better. Because everything is aspiring to. Buffy is aspiring to be a world without demons and vampires in it. Otherwise, she wouldn't fight so hard. Right? You read Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. They are giving you a world where there's less racism or no racism. They're imagining a better world than the one they live in. But not like marginally better, but like aspiring to be better. And that's why the I have a dream speech is so moving. It's platonic. Because he's telling you what the better world could look like out in the ether. That out in the ether, there are black and white kids who are playing together. Who don't care that they're black and don't care that they're white. And the parents don't care. And that's why you play the... I have, people cry. They're crying at the I have a dream, dream speech. And why it's more better remembered than the mountain side speech. Which is a downer. I mean, it's a great speech. Don't get me wrong. But it's also like... You'll get there. I might not get there. Well, he's assassinated not long after. But it's also like, that's the, the, the mountainside speech. The other side of the mountain is the speech of, it's going to take work, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be a struggle, and it's going to be every day, but it will get better. Whereas the, I have a dream speech, is Plato. It is, it is 
dreaming of, it is seen of, it is being jacked into a universe of a perfect form of a better American life. That brings us to Aristotle. Knowledge of the fact differs from knowledge of the reason for the fact. I love that quote. And you know why? Because that's my class. My class is that. What, I, what you get a lot of students being like, history is knowledge of the fact. Columbus sailed in 1492. And I, my class as a professor, is the second part of that. It differs from knowledge of the reason for the fact. I don't care about 1492. I care about why 1492 happens. Ha 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 ha. Plato had this to say about Aristotle. Aristotle is going to break up with Plato. Aristotle is a student of Plato and he breaks famously breaks up with Plato. And Plato says this about it. I love this quote because I want you to know that all these guys knew each other and they all were human. And so they all had like Aristophanes hates Socrates and Socrates thinks Aristophanes is an idiot and Plato hates. And then, then Socrates is murdered and then Plato hates Aristophanes for, for jazzing up the people for making them upset. So he's got a hit thing. And then like Aristotle thinks Plato's like, dude, get over it. It's been 30 years. Uh, Socrates is dead. You got to get over this stuff. And like, so Plato, like all these people know each other and they're all reacting to each other. They're people. So when I use high school as an example, like this is the Greek world in the 300s. These, all these guys knew each other. Aristotle, says Plato, has kicked us off. He's talking to his students. So they ask, oh, what, what is Aristotle doing? Why, why, why doesn't he like us anymore? He goes, Aristotle has kicked us off just as chickens do to their mother after they have been hatched. <laughs> Plato holds a grudge, man. <laughs> Plato holds a grudge. <laughs> He's like, I taught Aristotle everything he knows. <laughs> and he goes off. But that's the way parents are, right? You know, your kids leave for college and you're like, ah, oh, and then they come back knowing stuff you never knew. And you're like, ah, oh. freaking kids. So Aristotle is Plato's student. He's, and he thinks Plato is full of it. He thinks Plato's wrong. He will be the eventual teacher of Alexander. And that, that may be pound for pound, the greatest class of students ever assembled. There's about 12 students in it. They are the Macedonian um, hierarchy. They are Macedonian nobility. There's Alexander, who will go on to conquer Persia. There are, if I'm, my count might be wrong, but there are three future kings in that class. Um, there are, they're all going to be generals. They're all going to be great soldiers. They're all going to move on to great things. Uh, they are going to be the conquerors of the world. And that's how school, let's be honest, that's how school, my idea is that, is that how, how school should be? It should be 15 kids and a teacher doing a class. And shouldn't really be more than that. It should be 10 to 15 kids because you need enough that you have enough people to bounce ideas off of. You can't have two. You can't have a class of three. Like, it just doesn't work. That's, that's private study. Here's your book. Here's your questions. Go off and do what you need to do. Like, a good class is you bring people. But 40 people is too many people. There's not a, they crowd out everyone's ideas. There's no, there's, no, there's no space to breathe. So modern American industrial education doesn't work either. Where you put 40 kids in a class, the only thing you could do is platonic. The only thing I can do is give you the information and say, okay, learn it. Because we can't sit and invent stuff. There's, there's not enough time. So play, Aristotle will go on to invent the scientific categorization of plants and animals. He thinks, now just so you know, that he's not perfect in everything. He thinks women are malformed men. And this is why we end up with science. Um, because science by 1500 is realizing Aristotle's wrong about stuff. But the problem is, is everyone, and we're going to get to this importance and famous for, everyone thinks he's right. He is the most famous, he is considered to be the smartest man who ever lived in Europe. Smarter than Aristotle. No, smarter than Plato. In the Middle Ages, he is the founder of science. He is on which science, all science is built. So if you want to be a scientist, if you're Francis Bacon, if you're Galileo, 
if you're later on Newton, everything you're doing is having to make reference to Aristotle because everyone assumes Aristotle's right. So you have to tell people not only why you're right, you have to prove beyond a shadow of anyone's doubt, Aristotle is wrong. And this is where we, he thinks women are malformed men. So he takes kind of the platonic idea that all humans should be men. Men are awesome. Now that's, we've talked about this. Uh, that's cultural. That's not, has anything to do with biology. Um, it has to do with farmers being farmers and the work and all that kind of stuff. But he thinks women's bodies are supposed to become men's bodies. And they just like, he looks at their dingle. He looks at a man's dingle hopper and a woman's lack of a dingle hopper and says, see, see, if you, if you just, you know, did what Bill Cosby made as a joke in uh, himself in the eighties, where um, he tells the story of he, he has a daughter and his father comes up and goes, uh, son, you left the uh, stem off the apple. And he's like, well, you know, it's a girl. Thanks for being a great granddad. Uh, you know, not all children have to be boys. And he's like, well, you know, if you hold their nose and you blow into their mouth hard enough. Just saying. And Bill Cosby tells the joke and the, and the crowd is laughing their ass off because he's like, oh, I'm tempted to be like, hmm, which is saying I don't really want a daughter. I wanted a son. But that, that is that simple. That is, you know, that women and men are simply are simply the the opposite of each other instead of different things. And what does science tell us? Science tells us the opposite. Science tells us that men are malformed women, because all embryos, all all fetuses, start as women. All men are women. They just get a certain hormone at a certain time. And we all know that you're not going to get the same hormone, the same quality of hormone, the same timing of hormone as everybody else. So there's no reason to say, oh, well, all of these, these, the, whether it's gay or trans or have nothing to do with biology. Of course, they have something to do with biology. They have something to do with culture, too. But they also have something to do with biology because it's all chemistry. And, you know, but we're all women. We're all women. We all start as women. It's just an accident that I'm a man. And it's even more of an accident that I'm the kind of man that I am. Biologically speaking, it's even more of an accident that I'm the kind of man that I am culturally speaking, that I'm white, I'm American, I'm a Christian, um, I'm all these various things, right? I'm middle class or upper middle class, uh, you know. I'm European cultured as opposed to you know, nativist American, I'm liberal, you know, that's all, that's all culturally accidental. That's even more accidental. Could have been all very different. So, so he's, he's this huge interest in the natural world of trying to understand how things work. Sometimes he's right. Scientific categorization of plants and animals. Um, my Swedish scientist Linnaeus will, will update Aristotle, not so much throw him out, but update it because by the 1700s, there's so much more knowledge of how animals behave, act, work that Aristotle didn't know. Like, he didn't have access. So, so now you have so much more knowledge and Aristotle's, you know, category, organizational spreadsheet didn't work anymore. So Linnaeus, a Swedish, a Swedish historian, a Swedish scientist, updates it. And that's the modern system we use today. So where is knowledge for Aristotle? Well, it's all around us. Remember, he thinks Plato is wrong. Plato thinks no one can access knowledge. Now, And Socrates thinks it's inside of you and you need help accessing it. So Aristotle says, no, 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 no. It's all around us. It's in nature. You can see it. You can touch it. You can experience it. It's everywhere. Knowledge is all around us. You can feel it in your bones. So how do you learn? By observation. You go and you look at it. You want to know how a river works? Go and look at it. You want to know how fish swim? Go and look at them. Do not, it's not experimentation. That's later, that's 1500 science. Why? Because that's manipulation. 
right? You start with a theory. I think if I feed, if all mouses do is eat bacon 24 hours a day, they will explode. Well, there is nowhere in nature that a mouse is going to eat bacon 24 hours a day. So what do you have to do? You have to manipulate nature so that you could create the mouse who then eats bacon 24 hours a day, right? You have to create that situation. And then you observe this manipulated situation. That's not Aristotle. That's modern science. Aristotle is you go out and you find it. You want to know how a river works? Go find a river. You want to know how a marriage works? Go and observe a working marriage. Go and ask. Go and observe it. And ladies and gentlemen, if you ever go and do this, you know, there, there must be a joke that old people do when they get when they join AA, AARP. They must hand give them a joke book when they sign up. Because I have asked several when I was um, a younger man, I asked several people, like, sir, you have uh, been married 60 years. What is your advice? And the all, all these guys, give the ex all old men give the exact same joke when they start. Well, I turned off my hearing aid back in 1991. <laughs> See, you stay married by not listening to your annoying wife. It's right out of the Flintstones. <laughs> uh, and then you ask his wife, uh, Mrs. Ma'am, uh, what's the secret to a wonderful marriage? And she will look you square in the face and say, you don't, I never told them about, I don't tell them about my other lovers on the side. You're like, okay, good. Thank you, ma'am. And then they're like, no, what I really mean is something else. And I'm like, oh, they like freaking out us youngins. But you observe it. You go and you see it. Now, our Plato would tell you, here's the handbook. Here's the book, Marriage for Dummies. Read it. Learn it. That's what you need to know. That's the perfect marriage. Do it. And that's like a lot of advice columns. They're writing, but this is my situation. Well, what do I need to do? And like the advice columnist will then say, this is what you should do, X, Y, Z. And well, how do they know? Well, they're coming from a, from a platonic, it, more likely, the whole, the whole methodology is platonic. I will tell you what you need to know. Whereas the advice is rarely, go and take a look at someone else like you. Go see, see what it's like. Ask. Why are there dumb people? Nature is accept accessible. So ignorance is a choice. You're choosing not to know. You choose not to know. You choose not to go to the river. You choose not to look at that marriage. You choose to not to open up the book. You choose not to go to class. You choose ignorance. It's easier. You could do it, but you don't because it's hard. So there are dumb people. They have potential, but they choose not to do it. What about democracy? Well, the same. It could work, but pe people have equal potential. They could do democracy, but they're likely to choose an easier path. And so democracy may start good, but it will degenerate into selfish tyranny. It's Oprah saying, you get a car and you get a car. Everybody gets a car. It's bribing the masses. It's some dude knowing he needs the most votes. So what is he going to do? Give the people what they want, not what they need. Those were 200 rich white people in that audience. Do you think they needed a car? An extra car? No. They all got to the studio somehow. But they all got a car. And they love her. And it's still, it's a meme. It's now a meme. You get healthcare. You get healthcare. Everybody gets healthcare. It's a meme. Right? You type in, you get a car, a meme. And you get all kinds of things. From gay marriage to opium and meth to all kinds of stuff. Right? That They make fun of it. Right. But that's that's what Aristotle worried about is the idea that you would just get bribed to get the votes. You just get money or stuff in exchange that you would get what you want, not what you need, because it's easier and you don't ask questions. And so the tyrant would do what they want. And by tyrant, it doesn't mean like a violent guy. It just means a non-democratic ruler.
And so the tyrant gets 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 power. The people get a better life. And they don't ask questions. And the tyrant does various different things. So in some ways, there are modern countries that work this way. They promise peace. They promise security. They promise money. They promise health care. They promise, you know, they promise things. Just don't question who's in charge. Just leave us in charge. And when we have a quote unquote election, you know who to vote for. And there will honestly be no one else to vote for. So what is he famous for? He's famous for being the smartest man alive to ever live. He is the basis of medieval knowledge. Now, is he the smartest man to ever live? Who knows? But that was his like fame. If he said it, it was considered true in the Middle Ages. He's the philosopher, not Plato, not Socrates. It's Aristotle is the philosopher. So like you see things like in soccer, in uh, Shakespeare, the philosopher said, like people would quote Aristotle. If you could quote Aristotle, you were right. So science to argue against Aristotle had to be right 100% of the time. Like think about your scientific method. Those of you who are science people, right? You have to make your theory. You have to collect your evidence. You have to do your experiments. You have to collect your data. And then it has to work. And then when you give all your stuff to somebody else, they have to follow the scientific method. They have to follow steps one through 12. Exactly. And that has to work exactly the same. For science to be science, it has to be right 100% of the time. Why? Why such a high standard? Because everyone assumed Aristotle was right. And science is saying, we don't think he is. We think the earth revolves around the sun, not the sun around the earth. We think men and women are different, or maybe men are even women who have become men, not the other way around. We think, and they go on and go on and go on, right? That white light isn't white. It's in fact multicolored. And if you've read The Lord of the Rings, there's a discussion about this. Where Sauron is, uh, Saruman is like, he shows up in his new robes. He's a gaudy giant rainbow robes and Gandalf is like WTF you were you were Saruman the White and he's like I've upgraded I've leveled up and he goes I haven't changed and Gandalf's like look at you you're this gaudy explosion of color and he's like ah but isn't white all colors within it and you're like, yeah, but dude. So this is like, here it is. It's like, right. It's even in Lord of the Rings. This is what we're talking about, right? You, so like, Aristotle's like, white light is white. It's pure. It's good. It's this. And and here comes Newton being like, well, if I take it through this piece of glass, it turns out it's it breaks up into all these different wavelengths. That white light isn't white. It's a combination of all the different colors. And every artist in the world says, nah, man, F that. When I take all my colors and I mix them together, I get mud. I do not get white. You know, the idea is that white is the lack of color, not all of colors. And yet here's Newton saying white is all of colors. And here's Aristotle being like, 2,000 years earlier, being like, white is pure. White is, white is the lack of color. You know, and it's... And, they, and then it shows up in Gandalf's conversation with Saruman. So, my point is that we see this stuff, and it's all trauma, from Socrates to Plato's trauma to Aristotle's trauma. Aristotle is traumatized by having Plato as his teacher. I mean, like, he's, he must have sat there being like, no, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. And he had to go invent a whole new way of philosophy, a whole new way of education. Like, think about how traumatic that is. You could hate me and hate my class, and you may think I'm wrong. None of you are probably, probably none of you are going to go off and invent a new form of history. Because of it. Aristotle did. So, it's all trauma. 
and it's trying to understand that trauma. It's trying to understand the world that's built upon that trauma. And it's trying in some ways to, to understand who people are and why do they do what they do? And who do they, do they have to be this way? All three of them, that's why we do the, why are there dumb people? Because all three look at people and go, you could be so much better. Why aren't you? Why don't you want to be? Why are, it's, 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 it's in one of the earliest office episodes, right? Why are you the way you are? Right? Isn't that Michael Scott says that? Why are you the way you are? Or what makes you the way you are? That's these philosophers. What makes the world the way it is? What makes people the way they are? You could be so much better. Why aren't you? And that itself is a trauma. To believe that the world could be better. And those of you who are living in climate change know this. Like you know that in 20 years, in 30 years, life will be worse. And you're living with the knowledge that it's going to be hotter. There's going to be bigger storms. That worse weather is coming. And you say, why don't people change? Why don't we change? We could change. We could live better than we're living. We could have more equality, more freedom, more money, better jobs, more time with our kids. We could have a better life. Why don't we? And that's the trauma of knowing you could and not being able to do it. So be safe, take care, and thank you.